Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome all who are here present, and welcome those who are joining us by live stream and around the country and around the world. So you're all very welcome to this, our Carmelite, our annual Carmelite pilgrimage to Walsingham. And we begin now with an opening talk, and then at 12 we will have Mass, and that will also be, of course, available on live stream. So I'd like to begin now by saying a little bit about who Mary is for us Carmelites. That's kind of the, the basis of this talk. Who is Mary for us? Carmelite order called the Order of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Mary has been fundamental to the Order's identity from the very beginning. This is who we are. We belong to the Order of Carmel, the Order of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And having said that, what perhaps is, might be more surprising than when we look at all this more than 800 years of tradition is that Carmelites actually say very little about Mary. There are long Carmelite treatises on Mary and specific Carmelite teachings on Mary. Very, very little. You struggle to find something like that. And why that might be, the answer is actually very simple. She's just one of us. She's just with us. She's just there. We don't need to say it or avert to the fact it's taken for granted. It's taken as just being. She's just one of us. And what draws us as Carmelites most to Mary is her silence, her prayer, her contemplation. She's a woman of prayer, a woman of contemplation, a woman of silence. And that's who we are as Carmelites. Our, our identity and her identity are intertwined. Nothing more needs to be said. No explanation is necessary. It just is. When we look at Mary, we see this great woman of prayer. This great woman of prayer who symbolizes or stands for the ideal that we aspire to, that we live for, to be like her, people of prayer, people who are close to her son, people who identify with her son. So, Mary is for us our ideal, our mother, our sister. She is one of us. And today, of course, we, we are here and privileged to be here on this great feast of Mary, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And we're here on this great feast. And what is striking is the very opening words of the gospel that we'll have at our Mass in a little while, that Mary and Joseph and Jesus went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And they went every year. Mary was a woman of pilgrimage. And we are following in her steps as we're here today. She knew what pilgrimage was. She went on pilgrimage. 
She's a person of pilgrimage. And therefore, that's what we are doing today, following her in her footsteps. But the real pilgrimage that we are on is the inner pilgrimage, the deep inner pilgrimage, the pilgrimage of prayer, the pilgrimage of the inner spiritual life. And that's who Mary is for us. She's the, she stands for this, for this, as this woman of prayer and contemplation. So Mary, for us as Carmelites then, is our identity. She's fundamental to who we are. She's fundamental to our identity. So welcome those who are joining us. You're very welcome and it's good to have you. We've just began because we have to keep up, at, up to time because of all who are joining us around the world on this pilgrimage, those who are coming electronically, but those of you filing in, you're very welcome and it's great to have you with us. I've been just been speaking about who Mary is for us as Carmelites and where she is fundamental to our identity. And we identify with her particularly as this person of prayer, this person of contemplation, the person who treasured all these things in her heart. And today we're celebrating the feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary what she contemplated in her heart, what she treasured in her heart. And what she treasures is her son, Jesus Christ. She is his mother, obviously, but much more importantly, she is his disciple. She is in a profound relationship of love with him. When we speak about Mary in our Carmelite tradition, we speak about Mary as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And that term is filled with symbolism. Mary of Mount Carmel. It's not just because the first Carmelites began on Mount Carmel and they built a church dedicated to Mary there, etc. There's something more profound also behind that expression. Carmel is a mountain, a biblical mountain. The mountains in the Bible are the places of meeting with God. They're the sacred places, the places where God makes himself known, where God manifests his presence, where God and humanity come face to face. That's what the mountains stand for. There are many mountains in the Bible, and they have this very powerful they play this very powerful, symbolic role, the places where we come face to face with God. So linking Mary with a mountain, identifying her with a biblical mountain, is to see her as the person, as the woman, who brings us face to face with God. In Contemplating Mary, we come before the face of God. She is, like the mountains in the Bible, a meeting place between God and humanity. It is in Mary and through Mary that God makes himself known. 
it is in and through Mary that God enters our world. Mary is the greatest manifestation of God. On the mountains, we have what the Bible calls these theophanies, these demonstrations of God, this making of God known, this showing of God, whatever we want to translate them. But it's through Mary, more than anyone else, that God makes himself known in the son that she gives birth to. In the son that she gives birth to, God is seen. Humanity and God come face to face. God is revealed to humanity in a way that he has never been seen before. So in linking Mary and Mount Carmel and using that expression, we realize that there, deep within us, is such powerful symbolism, such profound symbolism of Mary, the one who reveals God, who makes God known, this manifestation of God. There's an ancient Carmelite prayer that we say for, it is used in the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, July the 16th, and used in, in many Carmelite prayers where we pray that through the intercession of Mary, we will be brought to the true holy mountain, who is Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ becomes the true holy mountain, which of course is what he is. He is the manifestation of God. He is God making himself known. He is God coming before us. We see God face to face when we look at Mary's son, Jesus Christ. So the Carmelite tradition around Mary and Our Lady of Mount Carmel is so profound, and it is the fruit of prayer, the fruit of the Church's prayer. What is curious about Our Lady of Mount Carmel, this title, this devotion, in the church is that unlike Lourdes and other places, it's not linked to some miracle or some extraordinary happening. Neither is it linked to anything in the Bible. There's no reference to Mary ever being on Mount Carmel, though Carmelite tradition has many legends around us. It's not linked to anything in particular like that. Rather, it has grown out of the prayer of the church, grown out of the prayer and contemplation of the church. That title, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, this devotion that has spread right throughout the world, is totally and purely the fruit of the church's prayer of the church's meditation upon Mary and her place in our lives and in particular in her place in our prayer lives. So devotion to Our Lady of Mount Carmel shows us how the church over these centuries coming to know Mary ever more deeply and coming to know her ever more deeply through prayer. The whole prayer life say, of the church is deepened, matured. So when we speak in the Carmelite tradition about Mary 
and her place in our lives. We're speaking about the Church's tradition of prayer and what Mary stands for, first and foremost, for us as Carmelites, is this woman of prayer, this person who has come to know her son through prayer. She's the person of contemplation who treasured all these things in her heart, who carried them with her, who was there with the church at prayer. In the Carmelite tradition, we see ourselves as successors of Mary, who was with the early church at prayer. We're told at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles of the church gathered at prayer with Mary and the other women and many other people there, gathered in prayer. And in the Carmelite tradition, we have seen ourselves as successors of that. There's another dimension of Mary in the Carmelite tradition that I'd just like to say a little bit about. In linking Mary with Mount Carmel, the Carmelite tradition also from the very beginning linked her with Elijah, the prophet Elijah. Mary and Elijah, in a sense, were seen as the two foundations of the Carmelite order, the two foundations of this tradition. Or the Carmelites, the early Carmelites, saw themselves as the successors of Mary and Elijah, continuing that tradition that they stand for. So in linking Mary and Elijah, and indeed this is not something original, you see it in the Gospels, particularly in the way Luke's Gospel speaks about Mary. He uses so much of the language of the prophets. He presents Mary as a prophet. For example, the account of the Annunciation in Luke is very much written in the style of the call of the prophets. And there's so much other prophetic imagery used by Luke in his presenting of Mary. Mary is a prophet. Mary is part of the prophetic tradition of the Bible. And what characterizes the prophet? Who is the prophet in the Bible? The prophet is first and foremost the person who listens. Time and time again in the accounts of the prophets we get phrases like, the word of the Lord came to, or such a prophet heard God, or the voice of God spoke. There are people of listening. They are people, they are listeners. They are hearers of God's word. And of course, that is what Mary is. That's what the angel spoke to her. She heard the voice of the angel, heard the voice of God. So the prophet is somebody who hears God's word. Secondly, the prophet is somebody whose life is defined by God's word, who lives that word that they have heard. And that is Mary, of course. She's the, the person of the word, of God's word. God's word that she held on to, that she treasured, that she entered ever more deeply into. So she heard the word of God 
and lived by that word in the tradition of the prophets. We're inclined to think of prophets as people who foretell the future. But maybe a better way of seeing them would be people who point towards the future or whose lives point towards the future. And of course, Mary fits that. So her life is points toward, the whole life is prophetic. Mary speaks very little. That's why I said at the beginning, it's Mary's silence that draws Carmelites. It's Mary, she speaks very little, but her life speaks so much. Her life is her message. And that's very much the prophet's. It's not so much what they say, but how they live, what they live. Mary is the prophet of true Christianity. She's the prophet of discipleship. Her life witnesses to, bears witness to, what true discipleship of her son means, what it is about. What it, what it means to be a true disciple of her son. She's the prophet of discipleship, the prophet of Christianity. Her life is pointing towards, in the true prophetic sense, it's pointing towards what it means to be a, a Christian, a true disciple of her son. So the Carmelite tradition has seen Mary as a prophet, has seen her in terms of this prophetic tradition of the scriptures and of the church. She's written about, as I said, particularly in Luke's gospel, she's presented as prophet. And the Carmelite tradition has particularly linked her with Elijah. And of course that is natural because Mount Carmel is the mountain linked to Elijah in the Bible. But much more than that, Elijah is the prophet of the true relationship with God. Elijah is often called the prophet of prayer. But it's probably more accurate to say that Elijah is the prophet of what a right relationship with God is, or the right way or attitude with which to relate with God. Elijah is there at a very specific time in the history of the people of Israel when their way of relating with God was going off in all kinds of wrong directions when people had lost what it really meant to be God's people, what it meant to be in right relationship with God. Therefore, he's the prophet of what it truly means to be a biblical person, what it truly means to be a person of the Word, of the Bible, a true person of God. That's specifically who Elijah is in the Bible. And the role that he plays right down to the present is there all the time. That ever presence of Elijah. That person who stands for and points towards what a right relationship with God is about. So in the Carmelite tradition, in linking Mary and Elijah, Carmelites have been drawing from the whole biblical tradition what it means to relate with God. In the spirit of Elijah, as successors of Elijah, and seeing Mary as Elijah's greatest successor, or Mary as living in the spirit 
of Elijah. That Mary can show us and can teach us what a right relationship with her son is. Another way of putting it is that in the Carmelite tradition, if we stay close to Mary, we will stay close to her son. Just like in the Bible, when the people stayed close to the prophets, when the people had a prophet, when the people were listening to the prophets, their relationship with God was right. Things went wrong when there was no prophet. Things went wrong when they were not listening to the prophets. So it is for the Christian. We go wrong. We go in wrong directions. We distort our faith. Our prayer doesn't grow and deepen when we are distant from Mary. To stay close to Mary is to stay close to her son. She is a teacher of prayer. Mary, in the Carmelite tradition, is a great teacher of prayer. We could perhaps object, say, well, she doesn't give us any teaching. We don't hear any words from her. We don't, she doesn't tell us how to pray or anything like that. But she does something far more powerful than that. It's her presence. It's her fidelity. It's her following of her son. It's what she stands for, what she witnesses to. Her presence and her silence. They are the two characteristics of Mary as the gospel presents them. She is present and she is silent. She's present at the foot of the cross. She's present with the early, this first disciples after the resurrection. She is present. She may say a few words like at the wedding at Cana and Galilee and at the Annunciation, but for the most part, she is silent. And that is the ideal of the Carmelite rule. That's the ideal that the first Carmelites lived by and what has been part of the Carmelite tradition down through the centuries, meditating day and night on the law of the Lord, on the Bible. That's not meditating in the sense of something intellectual, something all the time thinking about the Bible, but rather just breathing its air. That's what they did by settling on a biblical mountain, just to breathe the air of the Bible, to be in its environment, to be just to be there, and to live, as the Carmelite rule says, in allegiance to Jesus Christ. That's who Mary is. She's the biblical woman, the woman of the word, the woman of the Bible, the prophetic woman whose whole life is dedicated to her son, whose whole life manifests and reveals to us what it means to be a disciple of her son. She is Jesus' first disciple in every sense of that word. She's the prophet of discipleship. She's the prophet of what it means to be a true and profound disciple of her son. So that very briefly is the sense of who Mary is for us as Carmelites. She's simply here. 
She's part of our lives. From her we take our identity. From her, by staying close to her, we learn who we are. And we see the model of how to live, how to live true discipleship, how to live as people of prayer. Okay, so I think that's probably enough, and we'll give a little break, and at 12 o'clock we will gather here for Mass, and those joining us on live stream, we, that Mass will also be live streamed at 12, so wherever you are around the world, welcome you again, all those who are making this pilgrimage electronically. And as I say, in a little over 20 minutes now, we will have Mass. Thank you.
Then this is the word of the Lord and step down. Yeah, yeah. Or just the word of the Lord. The following is an EWTN special presentation.